Dopey Podcast Dopey Podcast Well dopey now podcast. is the time for the Dopey Podcast, dopey podcast. Where you call in and dopey put podcast. all your life on blast And you call dopey in podcast. and talk about your past Because your dopey life was pure with us hardcore and fast So dopey now podcast. is the time for the Dopey Podcast Dopey Podcast It's the Dopey Podcast The Dopey, dopey podcast. podcast, yo This is the Dopey Podcast This is the Dopey Podcast Now if your life was pure with us hardcore and fast You feel like you want to put your life on blast Just call up the show and I talk about your past Cause now is the time for the Dopey Podcast Dopey Podcast It's the Dopey Podcast The Dopey Podcast, yo This is the Dopey Podcast This is the Dopey Podcast This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our friends at Aloe Recovery. They're located in sunny Southern California in Malibu and Silver Lake. And Aloe was created by our good friend Bob Forrest, his good friend Evan Haynes, their other friend Bob, and this other guy Jared. And they came up with this program designed to treat addicts with compassion rather than control. Bob and Evan had been to a ton of shitty rehabs and they wanted to make sure that the one they created was different. So they set it up where right from the beginning, an addict comes in to aloe and he gets treated well and he has a detox that is comfortable. Whether he's kicking dope, alcohol, or benzos, they make sure that the addict is comfortable. They treat co-occurring mental illness, dual diagnosis, including SMI. They have hundreds of years of experience. And when I say they have great amenities, I'm not whistling Dixie. They have surfing, sound bath meditation, yoga. Equine therapy, you name it, they got it. If you're fucked and you don't know where else to go, I would totally go to Aloe. All right, exciting new ad. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by our friends at the Narcissist Apocalypse Podcast. Were you raised in a dysfunctional family and grew up surrounded by one or more toxic human beings? Or maybe you're someone that ended up dating or marrying a wolf in sheep's clothing and it really fucked you up. If being around and attracting shitty people is a problem in your life and you want to feel less alone in the world, then come listen to Narcissist Apocalypse, a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of narcissistic abuse. You can find Narcissist Apocalypse on all podcast apps or at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Share your story, advocate for others, heal together, and come be a part of the Narcissist Apocalypse community. Hope you guys listen. Totally give it a try. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by the Great Healing Appalachia Festival. It is this weekend. It is sold out. But if you want to check out Hope in the Hills and what all the good stuff that they do, go to HealingAppalachia.org. Check them out at Healing Appalachia on Facebook and Healing Appalachia on Instagram. Linda heard me doing the ad this morning and she's like, I don't think you say Appalachia right. But that's Linda. This episode is also brought to you by listeners like you in the Dopey Nation by supporting the profoundly powerful and action-packed Patreon page. It's www.patreon.com slash dopeypodcast. If you love the show, give a couple bucks a month. Give a buck. Give $2,000 a month or give nothing. I will love you all the same anyway. If you want hats and you want stickers, please Venmo me. If you want t-shirts, hoodies, long sleeve shirts, tank tops, go to uh, www.dopeypodcast.com. DopeyCon is coming up. I need dopey stories. Send them in at dopeypodcast at gmail.com. Don't be a stranger. That's all the ads. Here is the show. All right, hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast about drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. And I'm Dave, 
and we're in Manhattan, and all you dopey fans who are wondering, when will Peter come back? <laughs> well, wonder no longer, because here he is. Yeah, why, why do you want me on? I, I, like, I understand my reason for being on the first time was because I could like tell stories about when you were a kid and stuff, but... You like, can't wh- even tell stories about when you <laughs> What's you got any stories? What story? No, I mean, about tell when you one were- story about when I was a kid. I told the, the the a lot of them. I remember nothing. <laughs> so what's serious? your no? What's your point? No, I'm just saying like I, you know I was never a drug addict and everything, so I don't understand why you want me on again. Because I think you're. I, I mean, honestly, because you were here, <laughs> I, I, I had gear. Right. That's I, the reason I'm on is because I was in Davy's apartment, and he was like, "Hey, you want to do? <laughs> do it? <laughs> do it? No, you're right. You're right. You you actually have changed since I developed my impression of no, you. No, let me hear the, the people people. Yo. I didn't want to tell you this yeah. when we were talking. People <laughs> loved your impression. Right. Of me. They but think it's on, but right. it's not on. It, well, it's 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 spot on for what you were, you know, ten years 15 ago. Fifteen years but, yeah, ago. Yeah, but you're right. It's it was more now. like twenty years ago. Was it? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. It was because more I like sometimes 20. read bios about you and they're like, and then that's you're when the, got, you think when you're get, joking, <laughs> but you're not joking. No, when did you get clean? It was like four years ago, three yeah, years. Yeah, but we weren't hanging out ten years ago. You yeah. were in fucking Costa Rica and I was in Los Angeles. I'm sure I'm sure not, you're listen, was even more spot we're on. We're talking about the last time, besides very recently, the last time you and I hung out was two thousand. That's nineteen <laughs> no, fucking really? years ago. No. Because September 11th was 2001. Yeah. Where were you in September 11th? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, Where were you? Where were you? Where was I? Yeah. I was, I was on the train to my messenger job, and, uh, and uh, I, I, the, the train wouldn't go into Manhattan, so I called up my, uh, my bosses, and I was sure that saying I was going to be late. I was sure they were going to you know, think I was lying. Uh, but, but, because but, because you were known to lie. No, not because I was because I was you were known, known to make known cockamamie to, no, excuses. No, because I was known to be late. Okay, I was known to be late. Uh, but yeah, I called them up and uh, they some. I was like, they instantly knew I was telling the truth. They were like, "Don't worry about it. Go home." And I was like, "Wow, that was uh, an, an answer I wasn't expecting." Well, and here's then, of course I went home and found out what had happened. The question is. In 2001 No, not because I was, I was always known to tell the truth I was known to be late Which I'm still known to for Okay You're known to, to, to be, be late, late Right And be wildly unpredictable We'll say With um, cockamamie <laughs> stories No, no That weren't cockamamie. lies But yeah. cockamamie stories That's for, <laughs> for damn sure But now tell me this uh-huh. Where were you living in 2001? Uh, oh, in Bay Ridge yeah. With who? Uh, just random dudes. When was that? I don't even remember that. Yeah, two thousand. I guess we weren't friends then. That's yeah, my right, point. Right, right, right. So the last time that we hung out was nineteen ninety nine or two thousand. So we're talking about twenty years ago. Yeah, I mean, I definitely remember. At one point, I just remember I was like, I was like, wow, Davy's just way too messed up to hang out with anymore. Because I try. Because for a long, I mean, obviously, because we lived together for a long time when you were drug addict, this and that. But at a certain point. It was just like it was, and I now understand like you can't even be around drug addicts because it's like you know it's 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 they're very unpredictable, volatile, depressed, miserable. Yeah, they that. can't it's do not, anything. It's not volatile. It was, yeah, it was just like you you obviously needed help, and I was you know obviously in no position to help you, and there was just nothing to uh, to be done when you, when you well not I mean listen we we went over this a little bit before I mean you were always always it was just like there were so many times when like uh, when like you know we'd be in your house and like. You know, you'd you you'd be you'd be obviously on the nod telling me about how like you've been clean for two days or something like that. You know what I mean? And I was like, wow, there's like I, I don't mean to like insult you. No, this is good. Yeah, yeah. I think this is good. Yeah, you were like you would go into the bathroom, like it was obvious what you were doing. You would come out and uh, you'd be like, uh, yo, dude, and you'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> you'd be like, yeah, I've been clean for two days, and like nodding out. You know what I mean? And it's like like uh, like it started out with like. Lies that would be like Where you'd be like Wait a minute Is he lying or not And then But when you get into The depths of drug addiction You're telling just like Super obvious lies That are just You know Well there's no truth There's no the truth yeah, There's yeah. no truth anywhere But you don't I mean and like, I observed it and, and at a certain point You're just like It's not like I stopped Hanging out with you Because I didn't like you I stopped hanging out with you Because it was uh, No we had gotten no, Into a huge fight Yeah I know We, we had a huge this. schism yeah, That's yeah. why we stopped Hanging out no. you, you, didn't, you didn't come back because I didn't reach out. That's the na- the nature of our relationship is that you do your thing and I reach out and then you either pay attention to me reaching out or you don't. But that that's just, the nature that of our relationship. That, all right, we're trying to make an entertaining show here. Let's not. Uh, no, but that was just the straw that that, that broke the camel's back. Oh, let, please make make the <laughs> make, by all means make the me, show entertaining. You want me to try really hard to make it entertaining? No, no, okay. I don't. I, what I want you to do is the, when we last saw the great Peter, 
I think, uh, did you have a beard then? Yeah, I mean, you know. He has a very thick beard, long ponytail. Yeah. Uh, it looks good, though. It looks all right. His <laughs> eyes are alive. Eyes are dancing. He's, he's moving. Um, so why do you want me on the show again to talk about? Well, yeah, I guess that was good. I, I gave a little bit more insight into what it was like when you were in the depths of your... Uh, Dude, ridiculous. one of the only rules of Dopey is you don't mock the show while you do it. That's just one. There are two rules. Uh-huh. You don't shit on the show and you don't get me in trouble with Linda. Those are the only oh. two rules of Dopey. So racism is acceptable? Well, what do you got? On my show, there were three rules. No yeah. lying, no spam, no racism. That's it. No lying, no, no spam, spam, no racism. Now, if you guys want to know, Peter had a big time <laughs> sports gambling show from Costa Rica, uh, which he was removed from. I had tons of shows. I was doing it for 11 years. He had tons of shows. It wasn't just one. Several shows on sports gambling no, <laughs> in Costa Rica. And and he was forcibly removed from a stupid you know scumbag company. Well, it was it was a long, I don't know how much I want to get into it, but let me just say this. Let me just say this. In the end, there was vindication on my part. Vindication, in, in the, yes, in the form of I, I don't know how much I should say. Well, though, what do you want to say? And I, what uh, I don't want you to yeah. do is say something and then tomorrow tell me we can't use it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Or, or the next day. Yeah. Or next uh, week. Uh, just, just, That's the new thing, by the way. People send in these voicemails. Or they even come on the show, and then they ask me to take it down after I put it up. Really? Oh, yeah. No, that's uh, you can't do that. I mean, that yeah, terrible. <laughs> that's so. How, so that's so, how you get people. You get them to sign the waiver. That's how Ali nah. G does it, right? They can sign. Oh shit! Sign the waiver. Ali G. Yeah. Yeah. Sign the waiver. Get them caught up in the moment, and then uh, they're locked you know, in. Yeah, they're locked in. So, what was the vindication? No, just just the, like um, uh, can we cut this? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, no, I'm no, kidding. Can do I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding around. Uh, no, it's it just that 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 like um, some of the some of the uh, uh, the issues that I had, the truth came to light. Let's just put it that way. It turned out that you know I was justified in uh, in feeling certain ways. It's not interesting because I can't get into details. It's fine. So, yeah. The point is, Peter had a bunch of sports gambling shows, and now he lives in Brooklyn and he works for some Israeli uh, <laughs> real estate company. But so I have this idea to link Peter up with some guys at my job and create a new podcast right. about sports gambling and betting. And Peter came over to have our first meeting <laughs> yeah. on this project, and I said, "Why don't we just do the show?" You mean today, right now? Yeah, I mean, this were, show. Yeah, you were so, like, yeah. "Yo, dude." You want to shoot an episode of Dopey? And I was like, all right. <laughs> That's the way. And you were like, okay. <laughs> I said, so you want to do the show? <laughs> you want to do it? Let me hear the sure. old, let me hear the old, the old impression. The old impression? Yeah. What yeah. do you mean the old impression? The old impression of me. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> I hate Todd. But I hate you more. I'm not joking. <laughs> you think I'm joking. I'm not joking. Get out of my house. I don't know how people, the, the first, audience, how did, you, what? Before you get out of my house, you want a bong hit? <laughs> <laughs> Have a bong hit. Is that what you're, I would do? You're a real piece of work. All right. You don't have to leave my house, but just know I hate you. It doesn't sound like anything Have I would say. Bonded. What I really don't understand don't is you, how- you don't remember when you, when you, you were, you were you, first of all, that was one thing. Before we were shooting, I was walking around. I was just remembering how, like, it's so, and this is this is a massive. It's so uh, different hanging out with you now than then. Like now, it's like it's 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 a joy to be with you. And back then, it was awful. Like it was so dark and negative every moment. And um, I guess I because you were a junkie for so long. I guess I just sort of yeah, I forgot. Like I thought that was just how you were. You're so different now. It's unbelievable. It's but what unbelievable. I, but what I, I am like how I was in high school. Though. I guess so, yeah. You know, but you can't remember. You can't retrace. But the point is, <laughs> yeah. I think the most important thing that you're saying is that I was at the depths of fucking misery yeah. and like depression and hopelessness and like near death, yeah. literally. And I could come back and, and my life is like very rich. And it's, it's amazing. It's only rich because I stopped getting high. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's unbelievable. It's like unbel- as someone who experienced you at that point and now, it's just. It's miraculous. It really is. Like well, the, night and day. The funny thing day. about it is, like, people who listen, like, don't think I'm, like, dopey enough or whatever. What do you mean? Well, because, like, I'm they don't so... don't believe you were a junkie? That I'm just... No, I, I just get that feeling that I'm Trust so far... Trust me. I'm so far <laughs> removed. You know what I mean? Isn't that so crazy how, what? like, that a, a life can change so much? Now, do you believe that? You were that? high all the time and lying about it. 
You know what I mean? Or also, or not lying. Or not lying. Yeah. Right, right. No, half the time you, yeah, yeah. Half the time you'd be like, uh, yeah, just shut up. But, or whatever you, but, but then the other half the time you'd be like, yeah, I've been clean for two days. I don't remember lying. I remember more like asking for money. Yeah. You know, so I could get high because I didn't want to not be high. Like, I don't remember like presenting as not high. Cause I would even yeah, be I, like to my dad, I'd be like, I'm not going anywhere unless you give me some money. Right. You no, know? I don't, I don't, I don't remember any specific uh, events, but I definitely remember like it's at, at a certain point, it, it did get to the point where like you would like, you know, say you were going to get clean or claim you were clean for like, you know, a day or something. You'd be like, I haven't, you know, done heroin Since two days. Last night. And it's, it would be obvious that you would like just done it in the bathroom that, that when you, that when you got up from the living room, and went to the bathroom, that that's what you did. And I, I remember thinking like, wow, this is really like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle it. It's crazy. And the worst that you're like, wow, I live in this guy's apartment and I don't pay rent. <laughs> exactly. Like, what am I going to do? Exactly. Exactly. That is funny. Um, the other thing, huh? no, of course I did. what did you pay? Three, like $200 or something. You paid the whole thing probably. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> that's yeah. the funniest part. Um, but, um, <laughs> But also, last time you were on the show, on a serious note, you talked about struggling with with depression. Yeah. And here we are, and I have to say, you seem really good, but I well, know you haven't been really good, so I'm, how have you been? I mean, I'm doing, uh, you know, a lot better, but I mean, I could talk about depression for, like, you know, months, and I, I, I actually realized, like, I don't stay in touch with uh, with pop culture at all, <laughs> you know? The only thing I watch is, like, documentaries, and by the way, that's Daniel Johnston died. That was really sad. I used to watch documentaries about him all the time, but I watch, like... Docu- now, people compare my music to his music all yes, the time. Yes, I, I, that's, I, that's what I was, because when he died, I was watching it, and I was like, man, there's, like, a huge chunk of 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 like it they called it the the new sincerity and part of the reason that your songs are so good is because they're so sincere dave i should have like gotten in down an idiotic with way i know i should have gotten <laughs> down with that new sincerity like but what daniel johnson daniel johnson was much crazier than i was yeah, yeah. and he was much more confident than i was um because if I wasn't com- I was talking to Justin about it the other day. You're if I had, huh? you're like the most confident person I ever. You're In, like a confidence man, but not, uh, not real confidence. Like confident, really? it requires you're you to lying lie. about that too. I wasn't lying about anything. <laughs> I don't even believe the lying about the dope. I think I was very honest about. The yeah, dope. no, no. I mean, you can't help but lie when you're in that in the in the depths. What I mean the, though was musically, I was not com. It was it was. It was a stretch yeah. to say, I'm a guitar player. I'm going to go out every night and play it like Daniel Johnston did. And I can understand why, <laughs> you know, because your songs didn't sound like Mr. Mr. or whatever. You know what I mean? Mr. Or like, Mr. Or the Smiths or anything. You know? my, it didn't. But I'm saying if I had confidence, yeah. I believe that I, I, people could have gotten down with my songs. I have good songs. Yeah, he really did have. Yeah, you had great songs. And he really did like. Uh, he went for it. He yeah. lived the life. Yeah. And I, I didn't. And it's like, I don't have that many. Well, like you did. No, you did. You just, you just were. What are you talking But that's what I'm saying. Like you did actually do. You were just, you got. It derailed for 20 years by drug addiction. No, but I never, I never like went out and played every night. You played at sidewalks all the time. No, I think I played like a couple times. Uh, Yeah, but I mean. These people fucking go out every, every open mic and they build it and build it. And I didn't, I also had a TV thing and I was more interested in the TV thing at the time. If you trust me, if you, I mean. Daniel Johnson wasn't a, 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 a heroin. I mean, heroin, like he did. But he's mentally stuff, ill. Right? He was mentally ill. But the, the thing that heroin does is, and opiates do, is that they make you, they completely suck your time up. They just make you do nothing. Right. You know what I mean? Trust me, if you hadn't been a heroin addict, I mean, I remember you, and, you, and like you now, you have, like you're going to fucking stalk Artie this weekend. You were the same way back then. You had a ton of energy and a ton of confidence. It's just heroin sucked it all out. But you had, you had, that's another way you were like Daniel Johnson. Actually, you had a lot of energy and a lot of uh, confidence, even though you say it was uh, not real. But, but I just, that's, anyway, enough about yeah, my right, confidence right, right. And, and lack of a music career. I wanted to talk about your depression. One well, of the, one of the, the thing, I don't know if I told you this, but one of the messages I got was uh, I love Peter. He should do a podcast on depression oh, like you man. do on Dopey. I have a lot of, I mean, I, you know, the reason I, I know so much about depression is because I've been thinking about it for 25 years, right? So it's like well, anything. Because you're clinically and, yeah. depressed. Well, no, I, but see, that's the thing. I don't know, though. No, because the thing, there there, there's go. a lot. No, I'm just saying that, like, you know, like, like one of my, one of my, you know, how I used to also have, like, comedy ideas. You know what I mean? One, one of my, like. You com- don't have them anymore? I, you just told me a really I, good I bit in the yeah. kitchen. 
like, and I, it's not because I wanted to be a comedian. So the stuff would just come into my head. So one of my, this is from like, you know, 25 years ago is, uh, like the time traveler, uh, psychiatrist, you know, and you'd have a psychiatrist who'd go back to like slavery days and like, <laughs> you know, give psychiatrists, psych- psychiatric help to like slaves. That is and like, yeah, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, like if, if, you know, I mean, I'm using slavery as, as an extreme example. Right. But you know, if there was like a slave in like the 1800s who like said he was depressed, you know, you wouldn't say that he should like exercise and like try to, you know, do my eat right and also take, you know, these pills and this and that, you know, you'd be like, well, it's completely fucked up. You're a slave under completely evil. Pe-. You know what I mean? It's like and that's just an, an extremely extreme example of of I think something that's in play, you know, in today's society a lot. And, and that, you know, a lot of what's called like, you know, depression is really just, you know, Dealing with the circumstances Decent of human beings, of, of yeah, who don't want to be, yeah. It's like you you have to either like become an evil person or be a, a victim of other people's. And it's like if when those are your only two choices, it can drive a person to, you know, unless you're like independently wealthy or something, it, it really fuck with your head. I'm not saying that's, that's all. Yeah, I'm not saying that's all. Obviously, there's many, 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 many reasons why, and it all gets lumped into one, uh, you know, big group. But. Um, I think I do, and, and there's another thing that I've definitely noticed, and I don't mean to offend anyone here, but um, you mean me? I'm the only person. No, here. no, I mean people in the listening, audience. But okay. like, but like, the people in my life, right, that I've met, uh-huh. who like know absolutely, like, who understand the least about depression, is like psychiatrists. You know what I mean? Like, they don't get it at all. For the most part, you know what I mean. I think that, like, you know, psychiatrists and the medical, uh, you know, uh, establishment is really good at handling stuff like, you know, schizophrenia or you know, bipolar disorder, stuff like that. You know, but quote unquote depression is something that's just like, you know, it's horribly handled, and they, you know, and and, and if they don't get good results, they just say, uh, you know, well, what you need is more of what I've been giving. You know what I mean? It's like well, it reminds me. It totally reminds me of addiction, right? You it's, know, yeah. and I think that when I was, you know, when I really stumbled into it. It was very much like, well, the world's going to end anyway. It was like the late 90s. It seemed like the world was coming to an end. Like trends were like those movies about the end of the world, yeah. apocalypse, Y2K, techno was starting to get big, the crusty punks in the street. <laughs> I just thought the world was going to fucking end. Like I felt like it was. You think some asshole comedian's going to steal my, uh, my fucking uh, slavery uh, bit? Slavery, time travel. Probably. Slavery, like, I, <laughs> probably. Can we cut that? Can we cut that? <laughs> I'd be probably. Can we cut that? They're probably going to take everything you've said. No, I'm just saying, like, dude. The whole point. Uh, you know what a comedian does? What? He shows up on a podcast and he tries bits. He doesn't worry about some asshole right. stealing. No, them. I'm not even. I'm just saying, like, uh, oh, Peter. I'm just saying, uh, like, you know, I, I, <laughs> I have so little in life, and like, if so, you know, but anyway, you, that's but, a good bit. Yeah, you know, but you did it on I Dopey, like and it was you. You know, you're gonna see Artie Lang at the fucking Artie Lang at the comedy Is cellar, he gonna like, go? He's, he's gonna, not, well, he's he's gonna, gonna be show like, up. He's gonna be like, what about the slavery? I imagine if you Artie's not gonna fucking show up. Artie's gonna, you know. Think Artie's gonna listen to this, steal your bit, and do it at the comedy cellar? All right, now you're making fun of me. Um, <laughs> anyway, so how, I mean, like, I have to say though, mm-hmm. you seem much better. Yeah. Like, and how the reason it- is because. Uh, well, but, but there's a lot of obviously there's a lot obviously like when it comes to you know depression, even people who uh, you know, are depressed because of circumstances, you know, uh, you know, pills and 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 um, and chemicals help as well. You know what I mean? Like if you're if you have someone who's like you know uh, uh, you know legitimately quote unquote depressed about something because of circumstances in that person's life. And then, you know, they take an antidepressant or something that might help them deal with it better. You right. Know, even if it's not, you know, so, so, but the main reason I'm, I'm, I'm doing well, there's a lot, I mean, again, there's so many reasons. I mean, the well, main, I think the biggest the reason stability. you're doing yeah. well is you're busy and you're stable. Yeah. And those are, I, I mean, for me, and I think that those are two things that I can also apply to recovery. Like when anybody the asks main, me, the main, all right, the main, re- the main okay. reason I'm doing better, please, is because, uh, I have a friend who really uh, cared about me a lot, and 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 like that's that's yes. Without without that, I whenever would, he says this, I feel like I didn't care enough. No, I'm not talking about. I, I know, but whenever, whenever whenever you talk about this angel in your life, no, I think I, why wasn't I the angel? No, in no, 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 no. I mean, most people most people are in a position to help people who right. need help. You no, know I, I mean? was not. Yeah, and 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 um, I was going to get you a busboy job at Katz's. Yeah, and like this, which would not have made you less depressed. No, I mean the, the friend who helped me uh, happened to be in a position where he could, and it could easily have been where he uh, wasn't in a position, then he wouldn't have helped. You know what I'm saying? It's not you know. But my uh, point is, it's. 
like, and people ask me when they're struggling with addiction, like, what can you do? Or, or they struggle with cravings or they struggle with the misery of the monotony. And I say, do something, do anything, stay busy. And I think you having a place that you have to go and things you're responsible for keeps you out of your mind in a way. Yeah. But I also had a friend who, you know, who gave you the ability to do that. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. 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 You know, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, but but as with everything, it's not just that. It's lo- it's lots of different things, you know, lots of things. So, like, do you have any techniques for bouncing out of the terrible darkness? Again, it's 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 the t- I, I and I also understand because I've known a lot of people who are quote unquote depressed. Uh, you know, techniques for, for for getting better and for coping with it are 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 different based on what's causing it in the first place. You know what I mean? So right, so, and there yeah. is no set answer to right. anything. It's so, like the same with addiction. Though. Well, it's because it's because all that stuff gets gr- like everything gets lumped into like when you have depression, you could have depression because like legitimate depression because you know uh, a pet died or maybe something horrible happens like a child died or you get divorced or whatever or maybe. Maybe you have no reason and you just have a chemical imbalance. There's so many reasons and they all tend to get lumped in. And treated the same way. And treated the same, yeah. And so, you know, it depends. I I, I think there are different subgroups where something that helps one person in that group would also be likely to help someone else in that group. But like, So, like, do you think one depressed person helping another could be a very effective tool? Definitely. Absolutely. Because they say one addict helping another is like without parallel the the most effective way. That's what I would assume, yeah. With Uh, depression too. Yes. And there is no fucking... D A, you know, there's no. I, I'm sorry. Hey, I, I didn't mean to insult psychiatrists before. I, I shouldn't have said. Fuck that. No. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> insult them. There's no it's like if there's a psychiatrist who's listening to this show and you feel offended, write me an email. No, and I'll send it to Peter. Thing, make him not, depressed. No, because the other thing is that psychiatrists have an impossible job. I mean, helping people who are depressed get undepressed is just, I mean, not an impossible job, but it's an incredibly difficult job. You're dealing with, you know, people who have, you know, profound, you know, uh, disorders of all different kinds all the time. It's an incredibly difficult job. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's raking leaves on a windy autumn day. I'm just saying. It's <laughs> Would you say it was yeah. like raking leaves on a windy autumn day? Uh, I don't know. So, uh, Have you ever raked, raked leaves on a windy <laughs> autumn day? Yeah. So do, do you think do you think Artie's really going to be at at, uh, at uh, tonight? The Comedy Cellar, probably no, doing no. your bit uh, at your at your at your. What is that? The, the Dopey Con. Dopey Con. Yeah. Definitely. I not. might go to that. I might go to that. Yeah, Peter. Peter, like he'd been out of my life for <laughs> for weeks and weeks and weeks. And he sees Dopey Con and he writes in his usual way. If you get me on the list, I'll be no, there. I was kidding. Around. I, I, I was, of yeah. course, but it, 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 I was happy because Peter doesn't understand this. That when I hear from him, it makes me happy. And let me ask you this, Pete. Okay. As a depressed person, because well, yeah. you're a very depressed person. It depends on your definition. Right, right. right I, dude, I'm just, you know, I don't know. Yeah. What makes you happy? Now? Yes. Nothing. Nothing. No, no. What makes me happy right now is, I, uh, I don't even know. I mean, I can tell you what, what interests me now. Like, I don't watch, I, don't, I haven't like, watched a movie in like 20 years or something. Uh, I, 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 I listen to a lot of uh, people's accounts of their near-death experiences. On, so you're on still YouTube. on that. Okay. But, well, except I exhausted it. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, now, well, now, now it's a little bit, uh, now, now I'm actually like starting to think about, you know, what I could do in the future. And actually being here with you today has made me happy. And, 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 and your enthusiasm for the, po- for the podcast with, uh, with the Dominican guys is, uh, making me happy. So yeah, now I'm looking forward to that. We're also looking for a title for the podcast. <laughs> so far, all I have is Jew Minican. <laughs> so if you guys have a better one, please email it to dopey podcast at gmail.com. Um, so Pete, yeah, we're on the verge of basketball season, my friend. And as you know, I'm a very, very voracious Knicks mm-hmm. fan. What what does the Dopey Nation have to look forward to in the NBA? Will the Lakers be the threat that everybody says? Well, actually, because now it's not like my uh, my full time job. I uh, I'm focusing only on baseball right now. I'm doing very well in baseball. Um, Who's better, the Mets or the Yankees? Right now, yes. You mean in terms of betting value? Yes. Or, um, I would uh, I would still say the Yankees. The Yankees are undervalued, even though everyone you know knows how great they are. Uh, so you know now that Stanton's back. Uh, today I, I forgot. Are they playing today? I can't. I can't even remember. Have you noticed how good a guitar player Bernie Williams is? <laughs> he's great. You have a bet on him. He's a, he's fucking. Uh, have you seen these videos? There are these videos. This company does these videos. Uh, songs around the world. 
Okay. And they'll take a song like this morning I saw on somebody's Facebook thing, they posted this song with, uh, you know, the, the, the weight by Rob. Oh, you the mean band. where they have people. Who, yeah. Oh, that's been around forever. Well, to, that's great. Bernie Williams that is fucking really? getting down in these things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what do you I, think? I remember I saw I saw one where they did "Stand by Me" that was awesome. I didn't like that because the really? guy changed the lyrics in the front. He's like, did he? Yeah, that maybe I'm misremembering. Me. No, no, it's possible it was, they did a few of them. It was very, it was very good. Yeah. You know, these videos are amazing. Yeah, they're awesome. It's like I almost cried. Yeah, I, I watched. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're really, really great. I watched. Uh, I think it was "We Don't Need No More Trouble," like Bob Marley oh, song. Really, yeah. and they're all like, it's like all these people singing, and then they show Bob. And I like oh, cried Oh really You know yeah, I was yeah, like yeah. oh my god You know was... I cried when Daniel Johnston died Did you? I did I didn't intend to But like His songs are really Like True level Find you in the end I mean that's a That's just an unbelievable I never listened to him I like got yeah. offended When people told me That my music Reminded them <laughs> Of him And I never listened to him Um Fuck Uh We are Gonna play this thing Okay. Okay. This is um, this dude. His name is Garen James. He's actually a pretty interesting guy. He's a cocaine addict in recovery, alcoholic in recovery. He was on a TV show called Gigolos. He was on what's that model name? Tyra Banks's show. And he kind of runs this mail escort service down in Florida. But he's interesting. He's an entrepreneur. Here he is. All right. This is very exciting. I have on the phone, and I'm going to introduce you kind of properly. A international male model who's retired, a total crackhead and cocaine addict in recovery, a reality TV star, an entrepreneur, Mr. Garen James. Welcome to Dopey. Well, hello there. Uh, <laughs> I love the crackhead. Uh, I used to uh, I used to call myself that all the time. Well, I think the funniest thing is when you're working in a business, right, and you're not working with addicts, and they say, I'm such a crackhead, but you actually are a crackhead, and you know how the expression oh, yeah. isn't really what it is. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, people use that term so loosely, and I'm like, um, no, you're actually not, like, selling your ass on the street corner. Um, so, you know, you, like, forgetting, you know, your your wallet is not – you know, a crackhead. It's more like if you stole somebody's wallet and then helped them look for it, then you'd be the crackhead. Right, right, right. That's that's more of an accurate depiction. So, Mr. Garen James, welcome to the show. How are you? How's life? I'm good. Thank you so much. So good to have you on the show. So you became some kind of a big shot model. And, and from what I understand in my limited knowledge, like that's when you got introduced to Blow. How did it happen? Like what was the beginning like? Well, actually, like I started, I had a corporate job and I started to get really bad into drugs and then got into recovery and sort of tried to follow this dream. And, and then, um, during that path, like I, I was in recovery and then I went to Europe and then didn't really have any sort of support system and shit just got crazy. I, I was in Spain and, um, I was in this model apartment and a guy was like, yeah, I'm going to the pharmacy to get some Valium because I don't like to fly. And I was like, excuse me, what did you say? He was like, yeah, I'm just going to go up to the pharmacy and get some Valium. I was like, you just go to the pharmacy and get Valium? And he's like, yeah. But you just ask for it. You don't need a prescription in Spain. I didn't know that. That's crazy. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, some of them will, and then other others, you just have to go to the clinic that's connected and just, like, say, I got anxiety, and they'll just quickly write you a, a subscription. So I ended up getting, like, um, Ritalin and uh, amphetamine, you know, and amphetamines and Valiums, and, you know, I had, I actually was so bad in, in, in Spain and in Barcelona uh, that a girl that I was semi-dating uh, I was like, I'm so, you know, whacked out. And she's like, okay, let's take you to the hospital. And so we get to the hospital and we're going and we're going and she's talking in Spanish and Spanish. We go through another room and she's like, oh, I'm just going to uh, get a coffee or something like that. And then, boom, we go into this other room and I was in the psych ward. and like on a lockdown facility for, for 48 hours. Well, how did and, that know, happen? Like, what happened? She just told them that, you know, I was psychotic and <laughs> I didn't even know what she was saying. Right. They were talking in Spanish, you know, and then, and then they, I was in a lockdown facility for 48 hours in Barcelona. And I had been to like a psych ward before, like a detox psych ward. 
and you know, so much interesting information that you can find out in psych wards. Like you'll you'll learn like, you know, governmental secrets. You know, if you listen to the guy talking to himself in the corner, you'll learn about aliens and shit. But like when I was in Spain, they were all like, you know, mumbling in Spanish. So unfortunately, I couldn't learn any governmental secrets because I don't speak Spanish. So. Right. But you jumped the gun. Like what what was the beginning? Like when you're working corporate jobs and you find yourself on drugs, like what was the beginning? Like what 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 was the casual to not casual relationship with drugs like for you? I don't know. It was like. You know, I had always drank a little and this and that, and then one day I tried cocaine, and it just was like from zero to 100. Um, I got really bad really quick, lost the job, um, just went into psychosis constantly, and I just stopped. I remember, like, I used to I used to just drive to the drug dealer's app, say I'm only going to buy 120 and then, you know, one $20 bag, and... Um, I would drive away and then end up like driving for eight hours, just doing loops and going back for another 20 and the drug dealer would be like, yo man, it's fucking hot and it's hot right now. You know, what the fuck are you doing back here? Like buy 10, like get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> yeah. and, like I, I just, you know, like I could all, I was always just like, no, no, no I promise it's the last one. You know, I used to go drive and be in psychosis. Like, um, I remember one night I was driving, it was like five in the morning. And I was on a run for, you know, like a day. And um, I actually was driving and I heard sirens and um, I knew that they kind of had me. You know, and I, I looked back, I saw sirens, I heard sirens, and I pulled over to the side of the road and rolled down my window and put my arms out of the window. And I was like, I give up, I give up. You know, and I'm waiting for them to come. And, and like, I turned my head and I turned around and there's nobody there, you know. So, right, classic uh, cocaine psychosis. I, yeah. Exactly. I mean, I just didn't, it wasn't fun, but I just couldn't not do the first one, which led to the, to the 20s, to the, you know, psychosis, led to eventually smoking crack. And like, and what was the, what was the escalation to crack all about? Like, what, what was, the, what was different in the experience with powder and crack for you? I was a hair. I'm a heroin addict, you know, like I'm like naturally, I mean, you sound naturally ridiculously up to me, but I was always naturally ridiculously up. And as soon as I had benzos or opiates, I like the bell rang for me. You know what I mean? Like I, I knew that's what I wanted to feel just total relaxation. And, and how did the, the crack hit you? Like, how did you feel it? Well, I think the biggest thing for me is that like I have, pretty much OCD so my brain sometimes will fixate on a conversation and I'll have that conversation in my head you know 52 times right and the thing that I <laughs> love about cocaine, that's funny to me continue please I'm sorry yeah so like the thing that that cocaine did for me was if I did a little bit of cocaine my mind ceased from obsessive compulsive thoughts and so in the beginning, it was just like clearing my head right. from all of the insanity and all of the, you know, repetitive thoughts and, um, you know, uh, just driving me crazy. So for me, that's what, you know, I really liked about the drug at first was that it just, it just, I made me stop thinking, made me stop feeling, made me stop, uh, just centered me, I feel like. Um, and then it just got to the point where, do a little bit more, do a little bit more. And then, you know, and you know, it became psychosis. So there, there came a point where I couldn't just do that little bit just to kind of feel normal. Totally. Um, yeah. So it, it just got to that point. I mean, uh, you know, the, the beauty of going from cocaine to crack is like, it's so instant. And then all I ever thought about was like the next hit which is, you know, uh, silencing of the rest of all of the insanity in my brain to only think about one thing, which is the cocaine and, you know, doing the next hit. Um, not thinking about 50 conversations that I've had in the past two days or, uh, you know, predictions or, you know, where did I leave this or did I turn off the lights at the house or, you know, just all of that insanity in my brain. And cocaine was a relief for that. Because it boils it all down to just the question, can I have the next hit? 
what will the, you know when can I get it give it to me now and that kind of straightens out the confusion in the mind I hear that that makes sense yeah so yeah. so when simple. yeah um so when you went from a uh, corporate job to uh modeling how did that even happen I just kind of was at a wedding and somebody said you have a good look and and then I, I didn't really follow up with that. And then I was in rehab and they were like, you need to find a, like a, a simple job. And so there was a playhouse near the, the, the halfway house that I went to after re- rehab. So, you know, I always had this dream to do some acting. And uh, so I went there and I got a job in the box office and I started to sit through rehearsals and things like that. And actually had a, a guy come through there do a one-man show named Charles Nelson Riley. Sure. And, yeah, and so he walked in the door one day, and I was in the box office. He was like, what are you doing behind this box office? You should be an actor. You know, I guess just because I was the way I said hello to him or whatever it was, he just saw something. Yes. And so he kind of took me under my wing, his wing, and started doing that. And so I started to do some plays and things like that. Uh, he was an amazing man, just like so, such a good teacher and so funny. And um, but anyway, he uh, so yeah, I started to do some acting, and then uh, when I started to go to commercial castings, I wasn't really trying to be a model. I saw guys in the casting blinds, and they had these model books, and I was like, "Well, what's that?" And they're like, "Yeah, you take some pictures, put it in the book, and you can go to castings for print work and make more money." So that's kind of how that happened. But you uh, didn't. You didn't wind up getting clean from the first time in rehab. You got out of rehab and you started using immediately, basically. Yeah. So that was like after the third time in rehab was when I did the whole playhouse thing and and then started that path and journey, um, and then stayed clean until I went to uh, until I went to Europe. And by the third time in rehab, I had this like thing in my head okay I get it I know I'm allergic to drugs there's no combo that works I've tried everything I've tried heroin you know just calm down the cocaine I've tried everything and um, so I went into Europe with this ego like I'll never do drugs again and uh, to make ends meet <laughs> yeah, I went to Italy and uh, little did I know that all the clothing is like for five foot ten guys. So I would book jobs and I'd be walking there six foot four and clothes wouldn't fit and I'd lose a job. So I started like go go dancing at clubs and do imaging where you you're in the VIP of clubs and you just sort of talk and you're talking English and it, I guess it's good for the club. And so I would have people that would walk up and say like, you know, hey, do you want some coke? And I'd be like. Let me see. Let me see what you got. And they pull out a little baggie, and I'd be like, "That's all you got." Like, right. if you're gonna offer me coke, you're gonna need like a mound of it. So, uh, I I really had this ego with cocaine, uh, uh, like an ego with like I'll never use again. And what do you mean? What do you what, what do you what do you mean an ego like you'd never use again? What do you mean by that? Uh, like I had this false sense that I just knew I would never use drugs again instead of like working on recovery. But why would you even, um, I mean like, like you just figured when you wanted to stop, you would stop kind of thing. You figured that. Uh, yeah. More, no, no, no. More like, no, no, no. What I'm saying, I would stop using drugs, right? I had completely stopped. However, I wasn't really working a recovery program when I was in Europe because there was no meetings. Um, English speaking meetings. However, I had this ego and this like lack of fear that I would ever get high again. I had this mindset that I knew I was allergic to drugs and I would never touch them again. Like you knew you so had it kind of thing. Like you were you were overconfident in your recovery in your sobriety or whatever without working a program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, but you were super, vu- really- Garen, you were super vulnerable though, right? You're working in nightlife. You're working oh, yeah. this crazy job yeah. where you're paid because of how you look. It's like part and parcel to addiction, right? Yeah. And I was in nightclubs, alcohol, people offering me drugs constantly. Um, not a great you know, situation for a person in recovery that actually has no recovery. Just, you know, this ego that he won't use again. So... It's a dangerous combination. Um, so I ended up, 
I ended up actually staying sober and clean during that time period until I went to Germany. And then I got like really lonely and the, the language was so difficult. And but basically I was on the subway after a casting and I came up the subway and here's how like addiction or the disease works. I was walking up the subway and there was a cart and I was going to get like a schnitzel and there was beers on it. And something in my brain said, you know what, when you get home to America, people are going to be like, you, you were in Germany. How is the beer? We're famous for beer, right? And you're going to say to people, oh, you didn't try any of the beers. Like, people are going to, like, think that you're the biggest idiot. Okay. But then, you know what? I went up to the stand and I was like, let me get a, uh, one of those Wirschenstein beers or whatever. And I opened it and drank it and I hadn't eaten and it was tall and, and the alcohol is very strong there. Right. And I just, I just felt it, you know, and I was like, oh, let me try that one as well. And... I just caught like this tiny little buzz and it was on like this. I, I turned around, went down to the subway station, went to the central hub station. And it's so funny. People are like, oh, I'm going to move location so I don't get high again. Like the geographical cure, right? So like here I am, I'm in Hamburg, Germany. Not only is it like somewhere I've never been, but I don't speak one word of German, like not one word, right? right uh -huh. uh, so I walked to the central hub station in Hamburg, Germany. And I just looked at people and I did the head nod. You know, the head nod? Sure. Like, just, just a little nod. And finally, like, a guy looked over at me and he nodded back. You were giving the head nod that said, the head nod that says, do you have cocaine? I'm drunk and I want some. Drunk. Yes. Yeah, drunk. Okay. You got okay. drunk. Yes. You know? yes. <laughs> and this guy, you know, you know, gives me a head nod and I follow him outside. And I'm like, uh, cocaine? He's like, yeah. Um, pulls out a little bag and I'm like I pull out like my money and I show him like my bills because I have no fucking idea like you know <laughs> what it is how much it's going to cost and he pointed out one bill and he took it and then I had cocaine and that's you know kind of like where that debacle went where I was back in, in Italy and then Spain and psych ward and um, came home from all of that and I ended up working as like a plumber's helper here I was I ended up getting blackballed from the industry. I didn't show up for a big job, and they called all the other agencies and told them I was a fuck up and came home and just started working as, like, I, I would run a jackhammer and basically would chop up floors of pre-existing houses and cut out the pipes for a plumber. And so basically I was working in shit. Right, but you were, and you stayed getting high. It pays okay, right? Oh, yeah, I was getting high. It was like a great job. If I didn't show up, it didn't really matter that much. Uh, at that time, I was doing like um, oxys and cocaine here and there. And so, you know, here I was, this college-educated guy, international male model, actor, commercials, theater, and ended up working in shit. Wow. Well, it's, po it's poetic, if nothing else, right? Yeah, it was, you know, uh, uh, you know <laughs> something that I'll never forget, to, to be honest with you, of, of, of where I ended up from, from this. So, um, ended up many arrests. I had 77 felony convictions. What was, what, was, what was the worst misadventure in the plumber's helper oxy-cocaine-fueled days? Like, what was the, the worst thing that ever happened in that situation? Uh, I could say that like the first, the, the worst day was the day that, um, I got arrested for the last time and my boss showed up, he knows I'm a drug addict and he says, are you good today? And I said, yeah, I'm really good today. Like he looked at me, he looked into my eyes. He said, okay, I need a favor. Here's $1,800. Go to Home Depot and get, um, and get me this list of things. And he said, you do, if you fuck this up, I'll basically, I'll kill you. Right. You know, that kind of like, you know, that's what he told me. Um, so I went to Home Depot with no intentions of getting high. I went and I bought all these items. And I was driving back to the location and I was at a stoplight and a dude looked over. And it's a German dude and, and he gives you the head nod? I, I looked over at him and he looked over at me and uh, 
he just gave me a nod. The head like, nod. The German head nod. He gave me the head nod. Yeah. The fucking, yeah. And so I, like, I did, like, I, like, I rolled down my window. It's like, yo, follow me back to the Home Depot parking lot. And he parked, and I said, let me just go back inside real quick. I'm going to return something. Like, and I only returned a $20 item, right? Right. And, you know, I used to think it was like these guys are really good at what they do, these, all of these drug dealers. Like, they're so good at what they do. They, like, they, they're able to spot, like, a guy who wants crack. But, like, today I realized, like, I probably looked over at him, like, salivating, you know, like, looking at him with these, like, you know, these, like, please, please be a drug dealer eyes. And, you know, these guys are not, you know, good at what they do. They just look at the dude that's looking at them that, you know, is, is, is like drooling. Well, it's the same way that we know who has drugs. They know who wants them. It's a radar, you know? They got, yeah. We, we give off that, that sense, like, hey. I need drugs, you know, so... I think, um, I think I still give it off. I live in New York, and I walk through Washington Square Park, and every fucking drug dealer gives me the fucking head nod. And I want to... Oh, yeah. I kind of half nod at them, and then I smile, and I say, no, you know, I'm good. You know what I mean? But it's funny that I still give it off. You know what I'm saying? Con- where, I mean, like, well, do, do you still get the head nods or no? Oh, well, listen, I was, in, um, I was in this place called the House of Hope, a Department of Corrections run treatment center. After I was in jail for uh, 10 months, I got sent into a six month uh, jail rehab. Right. And I was, out, I was out after two months, you go get a job, and I was on the bus, right? And there was a guy, like, we pulled up to a bus station, and, and uh, I, was, I was looking out, and um, this guy starts pointing at me and yelling. He's like, go next stop, next stop, next stop. And I, I was like, fuck, how does this guy, out of all of these people on the bus, know that I'm the crackhead on this bus that, like, <laughs> you know, and I haven't even gotten high in 16 months. How the fuck does this guy know who to call off this bus? And I was talking to my therapist about it uh, at the place, and he was like, I've got a little trick for you. He's like, don't look at them. They won't call you down. And so, like, I lived with that that process when when a guy pulls up like if i'm in my car and i and i look over and i see whatever that gives me that vibe that he's a drug dealer i won't look at him and it's worked and you know it's funny like uh, it was like a year ago i was in this uh i was in like port lauderdale this uh near this bad neighborhood and i was getting a coffee and i was going around the drive through at the, the dunkin donuts and there was a dude walking by and so i i i knew he was a drug dealer like i i just knew so i like i looked the other way i was driving by and so I looked in my rear view mirror at him and I was looking at him I was like, yeah, that dude's got shit, right? Right. And the dude had turned around and saw me in the rear view mirror right. staring him down and he started going, yo, 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 yo. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The dude caught me, the dude caught me uh, a second time around like staring him down through a rear view mirror. So, it's funny. It's like you know, staring my, at the sun my, or staring at a woman's ass. It's like the thing you don't want to do, and somehow you wind up doing it anyway. You know, it's really... So, yes. That's a trick. Yeah, that's the trick in early recovery. Like, do, just look the other way, and the dude won't call you down. I was, so in, I, w- I was in recovery in Florida for about a year. I, I went to a treatment center in, uh, in Delray. And um and it was a bad Watershed? year. No, Renaissance. Fucking bad year. Okay. Oh, um, Renaissance is the fucking oh yeah, that's like a what do they call that? The behavior modification. Yeah, plan? yeah, yeah, big time. They like called me out for being like the most toxic person there, like on many occasions. Like I had to carry a garbage bag with my stuff in it and stuff. But uh, I, I got a job working at a furniture furniture delivery place, and we had to go down right. to, to Opalaka. You know, wherever that is, I don't. It's, I think it's outside of Miami. Yeah. But supposedly it was yeah, some. No, yeah, it was supposedly the the heroin capital of Florida, and I just thought it was so. I mean, like I just got a kick out of the word Opalaka, um, and, and being you know in recovery, like I wasn't about trying to find heroin in Florida, but I was very very about finding weed there, and I found weed when I went to Seven Eleven. You know, some dude was in front of me. I was like, "Do you guys have nuggets?" And I just I was in halfway just smoking weed there. That was my experience in Florida. Um, when you went to jail, it all turned around for you, though, right? 
yeah, that was the saving point for me. And um, uh, thank God, the girl, I was living in her garage. I got all cracked out. She called the police on me. And um, so that was like the turning point for me. I had broken into her house and pawned some stuff. I was going to pay her back, the, you know, the, the rationalization. Right, 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 right. And she, and she called the police instead. And, you know, that that person is still like one of the angels in my life. Um, you know, I'm, I talk to her every once in a while and I've paid her back, you know, tenfold. So, but yeah, I mean, what the first few months I was in jail though, like, uh, I was just, uh, it seems like I always had like the crackhead roommate. I mean, the, the drug dealer roommate and he'd be like, yeah, man, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, in a couple of days, I'm going to flip this. I'm going to make a cookie. I'm going to be back on, back on the green and shit. Like, and I'd be sitting on my top bunk, like just literally like having to shit my pants from like this urge, this churning in my stomach. So you know, jail really saved me because I needed it. I, I needed to be locked away from, from drugs so that else I would continue to get high. What's a and cookie? A hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, what's a cookie? How do you make a cookie? What does that mean? Um, they usually call, like, when you make crack in a, uh, like, in a, let's say, a, a coffee pot. You know, it's a circle. Right. So you're making so a cookie of crack. Cool. That's cooking the crack up is you're making a cookie. Yes, exactly. When the crack is in like a circle, that's like a cookie. All right. A cookie of crack. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I love cookies, but I never had a cookie of crack. Conti I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. All right. So yeah, like you found that, that the isolation, and, and it's probably fucking scary as hell to be in jail down there. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not too, too bad. Like, you know, uh, Dade County Jail, I was in a couple times. That place is archaic, nasty, the roaches fight the rats. Brown County Jail is a little bit cleaner. So if you're in South Florida and you have the urge to commit a crime to get your next hit, which I completely understand and I don't judge you, just make sure that you commit those crimes in Broward County and not Dade County. Right, the right, jail right. Is much so you, you got sober in jail, which is amazing. Um, and I, I think that happens to a lot of people who are just at the end of their rope and they, they finally face it. So, like, what happened? Like, you, you, what happened in jail that made you uh, turn it around? Well, I was facing four years in prison, and I had a public defender, and she said, you know, I've looked at your records. You know, I see you were dual diagnosed, and you were on medication and treatment centers, and I think I can get you a downward departure in the mental health court. And I was like, what? You know, like, you're going to certify me as mental? And she's like, well, yeah, I think I can just get you, like, six, uh, six months uh, rehab, and you'll be able to go to work after two months. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm fucking crazy. Let's go. Like, do what you want to do. Um, and so she submitted me for the mental health court in Broward County, and uh, I got submitted after 10 months uh, to six months Department of Corrections run treatment center, 90 days at a halfway house, three years probation. But the good news is, is that I had no fines because they deemed me as indigent, so I didn't have to pay any court fines. Um, that's kind of a joke that I say because at one point in my life, like, I was indigent. Right. You were um, not only indigent, you were also dual diagnosed. So you were crazy and broke. You were broke-ass crazy. That was a good time, right? Broke-ass crazy. Broke-ass crazy. Like, so, you know, to be certified mental health court and also be indigent um, and to kind of get where I've gotten in life today like it's something that I think is inspiring to others um, I have a jail commitment uh, that I had for a year um, had to give it up in spiritual location but I was in I, I, it's so funny I like I, I volunteered for a jail program I got cleared for six years I tried to get a jail program and I submitted every year and I kept getting denied because I had too many felonies. And finally, one year, I submitted. And when I submitted the email, I made a video of, like, my my mug shots and, and then videos of where I am today in success. And I got I got accepted. And so I went to the to the jail place where you you know submit for meetings. And I raised my hand for a certain night that worked for me. And so I get to the jail that night, and they lead me down the hall, and they lead me into the same cell that I was in for six months. Right, so, that's crazy. It was one of these big, big, big cells, right? It was one of these big group things? Yeah, 
exactly like a hundred inmates. And I sat down and like, I was tearing up and, you know, I started the, the speech, like you guys, like, I know I'm supposed to be hard and, you know, I know I'm supposed to like have this front that, and I'm not crying because I'm scared, but I'm just crying because this is the same cell that I was in, um, you know, 12 years ago for six months. And I got to find the same cell to bring this meeting in for the next year. So was that coincidental um, or did they know where you stayed? No, it was totally a coincidence. Wow. I mean, or a God thing. I right, guess. right, right, right. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, so, so like, yeah. let's fast forward for a second because you know, I think that's amazing. You know what I mean? Like ad- when addiction, obviously when anybody can get out of a life of addiction, it's an amazing thing. And, uh, and we only have, you know, every day, you know, um, but what you wound up doing, I think is fascinating. You wound up starting a company called, uh, Cowboys for Angels, which is a male escort service, right? Yes. And it got featured on this show on Showtime Gigolos, correct? Yeah, um, you know, my message, like if there's people out there that have felonies or have been in psych wards or yeah. whatever it is, like my message is that that all happened to me, right? And when I was at the House of Hope, um, I went into my therapist's office and I said, hey, Bill, I know I'm supposed to go look for a job tomorrow. Um, uh, I have seven felonies right now. I haven't had a job on paper in two years. You know, I'm on medication, um, mental health court. I think the best option for me is to be on disability. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, really, I don't really think that I'm hireable. And my therapist said, yeah, you can apply for that. But in the meantime, there's some art galleries on Los Olas. Can you just walk into a couple and, you know, see if you can get like something part time? Uh, I think, you know, you used to do sales. Maybe that'd be a good fit for you. Right. So I went to the Salvation Army um, with my $10 allowance for the week, and I bought like a $2 pair of slacks and uh, like a $1 button down and a $5 pair of shoes and walked into an art gallery with my $10 outfit and said, hey, uh, actually, I walked into two. The first one, I walked in and walked out. And the second one, I walked in, and this guy like ran up on me like, uh, hey, how can I help you? And I just kind of spewed out, and I said, yeah, um, I'm actually looking for something part-time. I used to do sales. I don't know much about art, but if, you know, I could learn. And he was like, yeah, actually, you know, we're looking for somebody part-time. And I said, well, I just want you to know I'm in a program right now. Uh, I was suffering some, some addiction. and You let it all out. You told him right away. You told him your whole story. Boom. Told him. And he was like, you know what? Thank you for telling me that. I know somebody in recovery. Come back tomorrow and, and you know, for a couple hours, we'll get you started. And nice. I was like, what the fuck? And so... You know, that led to the next things that led to the next thing. And I worked for $6 an hour. And for the first six months that I got out of reco- uh, the, tree, uh, the, the rehab, I rode a bicycle. I rode a bicycle for six months. Yeah, um, that's how it works. Sober job, no money, fucking part-time thing. I, I got gotcha. you. I know. I know. I, I, I did, too. I'm with you. So all these people out there... Um, and then just the next thing led to the next thing that led to the next idea. And I just didn't give up. I didn't quit. Um, I had an idea for, for a, a, a website. I started it. Um, and I hustled. I, I got onto the Tyra Banks show, Dr. Phil, 2020, Nightline News, Cosmo Magazine, The Gigolo Show. Like, uh, I didn't stop. I didn't stop. Like, I worked 12 hours a day. The question is, though, like, because I know that every one of those places basically, you know, talks about where, you know, like what I like to think is where a Yenta crosses the line with a pimp. That's what like the, the crux of all of those shows. And you also like have to do the next right thing in recovery. So how do you make peace with that? And how do you answer all the critics who who want to know the blurred line between the two? Yeah, uh, you know, along the way, we've I've, I've, I've refused to do, like, 50 interviews because they wanted to do some sort of expose on, on prostitution or something. What is that? I'm sorry, one second. Um, so, 
you know, I've given up or not done several, several interviews because, you know, that's not what we do. Um, a, a pimp would sell somebody sex and we've never sold sex. Uh, we have men for events, weddings, you know, uh, trips. I've sent guys on, on 30 day trips to Europe, uh, cruises, just like, um, you know, it's so funny. People are like, okay, so this is about sex, right? And I'm like, well, I've got a guy on a seven day appointment. Do you think like they're having sex, you know, they're fucking for the full seven, seven days. days, the seven day smorgasbord, right? Yeah. That's gotta be on the right. Menu. So obviously, yeah, exactly. So obviously like it's about something else and a woman wanting somebody to hang out with somebody to travel with somebody to go to another country and feel safe with. So, what was the inspiration, just, though, Garen, for this business? Like, what what hit you in the head that you were like, I know I can sell companionship to lonely women? Like, how did you know you could do it? Well, first of all, it's not just lonely women. It's busy women. Sure. People with kids or been through a divorce. Right. Or CEOs that don't have time to date. Um, people that have been on bad date after bad date. Why not pay for the perfect date? So, you know, it's not just like, you know, this conception that it's like an old, lonely, attractive, right. unattractive right. person. Um, but um, um, the prior to me starting the agency, I dated a woman that had an agency, Women for Men. And so I had already sort of known about that kind of side of the business. So I decided to do kind of men for women, but do it a little bit differently than, you know, a girl doing a 30 minute appointment for something, you know, right. something, something, something so, nefarious. Uh, the, let me ask you a quick question yeah. though. Has it ever happened that you set up, you know, one of these women who want companionship for whatever reason and the dude falls in love with her? Has that ever happened? Um, <laughs> the answer is no. The hesitation tells me no. No, I mean I've had I've had guys like um, with with younger girls. Uh, I had like one people kind of date on the side, but it didn't really work out because eventually she was like, "You have to quit your job," you know. And he's like, "I can't quit my job," and so you know, it's just like I don't know. I don't think that it's you know when the intentions are at the beginning then. Um, then it would work out to something, you know, where people run off and get married. So, and did you, you yeah, used or, to be, you used to be an escort, right? Before you started running the company. Yeah. Well, actually the company, when we were smaller and we didn't have a lot of guys, I went out on a lot of appointments. So, and did you ever find like, uh, like, you know, temptation as an addict? Like, were they ever, was there ever drugs involved? Because you know, on the, maybe on the women for men side, on the half hour appointment side, there are a lot of drug, uh, drugs wrapped up in this kind of business. Like, did that ever cross the door in this situation for you? Uh, well, I actually had, a, you know, when I was in recovery this last, or this last time that I've been in recovery, I've been dialed in, meaning, like I, I have a sponsor, a home group, like I go to meetings, like I'm dialed in. So I feel like that has more protection for people than when I just was in Europe floating around with the ego. Um, I actually had a client who um, was doing drugs and was a drug addict and I was able to get her into a rehab. So um, Right. I was never in any sort of temptation to, to use drugs. I mean, it all depends on, you know, where you're at spiritually. If you're if you're not in a good spiritual place, then you shouldn't be in those situations. Right. But if you're in a spiritual place, then, you know, part of our uh, mission as, as people in recovery is to help the, the sick and suffering addict or alcoholic. So totally. Um, so, you know, in those situations, we do have to be around people that are using um, I wouldn't say, you know, you're lighting the pipe for them or sticking the needle in their arm, but you know, we're going to be around people that might have drugs in their pocket and, and you have so, to deal with it. That's just it, part of the job. Exactly. And if you're not spiritually fit, then you shouldn't be handling that kind of situation. But I'm um, sure but you're connected. Right. No, but I'm sure all of your dudes aren't in recovery either. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's not a recovery escort service. It's an escort service. Right. I mean, I have a couple guys that are in recovery. Um, so, um, you know, 
they just um, you know we we're we're not like a low level sort of like you know people hanging out on the streets kind of type of agency so we don't really get a lot of you know major drug addicts using our service yeah um so you know i don't i don't know i don't think anybody's ever been in danger in that sense none of your guys have ever been asked to light the pipe or uh or find the vein for the client <laughs> not as of yet <laughs> right on well i really appreciate you coming on um i love uh I love your story of recovery. I think it's fucking awesome. And I think, did your sponsor give you shit about it when he first, did you have to run your plan of uh, Cowboys for Angels by your sponsor? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I had a sponsor prior to, uh, a different sponsor prior to my new sponsor. Um, and so, you know, she uh, was supportive of it because of what it was you know, what it was, you know, it wasn't like some sort of prostitution ring. It's never has been that. And all of my press, you know, kind of talks about that. So, you know, I've actually had, it's so funny, like my phone number, I do have two phones now, like it's separate from my personal line, but I had a sponsee and uh, I was a sponsee for like two weeks. And then one day he called and then he, uh, he got the voicemail and I said, welcome to Cowboys for Angels, blah, 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 blah. And so he I went on the website and called me the next day and said, um, I made a decision that you're no longer my sponsor because of what you do for your work. And I don't think it's spiritual. And I was like, okay, you know, here's another idiot. Um, I don't know if he just wanted to get high and that was a great excuse, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of people that just hear the word escort and think the word prostitution. Um, but that makes sense, you know, but that makes sense. You got to yeah. give them a break. I mean, like, you know, if, yeah. if I didn't hear you tell me that it isn't that I would assume it's that too, you know, you, I mean, if you're right. not in the industry, it's not easy to, to assume a distinction and somebody who's in early recovery might be scared. You know what I mean? It might be triggering or whatever, but I'm sure you, f- you get defensive because it's like, what the fuck, man, I'm not Heidi Fleiss. You know, you're not doing that exactly. job. I got gotcha. you. I think that makes sense. Um, and what's the biggest challenge uh, of, of reconciling your work and your recovery? Is there one or is it just like you are doing right by your clients and your dudes? Like, has there been a terrible challenge that you had to face with the two? I've never, I've never had any sort of spiritual dilemma in what I do. I mean, I have like stacks and stacks of emails from clients saying, you know, uh, I was, I was abused as a child and raped and I've always been afraid of men. And, you know, this experience has kind of opened me up to dating guys again, or like a woman who's, who was in a wheelchair and, uh, went out on a beautiful date or woman who's been through a divorce, going through hell and had like a fun night. Um, I do believe that we do good in the society um, for for profit, of course, but yeah. I do believe that we do good in this society. So I've never had a spiritual dilemma for, for my job or work. And in fact, it's kind of strengthened me and how I treat people and, and the needs of others and the needs of women. So. Do you think do you think it's it has something to do with the fact that it's dudes for girl, for women as opposed with women for men that it changes some sort of dynamic? 100%. Because women want something that. different than men want. Exactly. I do believe that men look for something different. All right. Cool. Well, do you yeah. feel good about your experience on the greatest addiction podcast out there? I really enjoyed your questions. I truly appreciate it. Keep what you're doing. We need a lot of information out there. You know, the, uh, the drug stories and then where people get to. So, you know, I really appreciate what you do out there and uh, hey, hey, keep but, it up. Wait, bef- I appreciate that. But before you go, give me the worst fucking crack story you got before you go. A real crack a lack of crack story. Okay. Crack story. So I was, uh, after four years of being in recovery, I didn't really share this. Um, I ended up, it's a long story. It's actually too long to tell, but let's just say that I, uh, I got a broken nose and from a fight and, uh, I went in for 
surgery because my nose was really messed up. So I went in for a nose job, cosmetic surgery. And I was so embarrassed of, of getting into this fight and going into this, you know, getting cosmetic surgery that I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my sponsor, my sponsor brothers. I kind of just snuck into this thing. And when I woke up, they were like, you're on some morphine. Do you want some Demerol? And I was like, fuck yeah. And got the script. And the next day I was driving through the hood buying crack. And like, I had a nose bandage on my face. Yeah. And like, if I would have walked into Walgreens and said, can I get a pack of cigarettes? They're like, uh, should you be smoking, you know, right after surgery? Isn't that, you know, ill advised? But like, I, wa- I rolled in with a face bandage into the hood and I was like, I need a 20. And the dude sold me a 20, you know? And I ended up, uh, smoking for like five or six days and because of recovery people started coming to knock on my door and so one of the guys came and said if you don't come out of here i'm going to call the cops you know i'm gonna we need to take you to bark detox so anyway um i knew i wasn't getting into detox it was 10 o'clock at night they only had limited bed and i'm going to get to the point of the story sorry i'm with but you garen I'm enjoy- i like dopey in. stories keep going all right, so I ended up going to this, uh, this detox, and I went into the detox. They said no beds available, and I was walking out, and a nurse walked by and said, Brett, what are you doing here? And I turned around. He's like, oh, my God, you look terrible. Um, and he said, come to the back room. I was bringing in an H&I meeting into that facility for three years every other Monday night. Oh, my God. For, for three years. And the guy said, listen, we... we um, we save one bed for the Department of Corrections, and I'm giving you that bed tonight, Brett. And I can, like, tear up right now from that. Um, uh, sorry, I have two names. Today. People call me Brett and Garen. So, anyway. Um, I figured. That was the next um, question. But keep going. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's my middle name. So, I go by both in different arenas. I'm a chameleon, I guess. Still, still a chameleon. When you, when you check so, into rehab, you're Brett. <laughs> and when you're doing your, your business, you're Garen. I got you. Garen, yeah, exactly. So, um, so he ended up giving me a bed that night. Thank God he did. I don't know if I'd still be here. But I went back um, uh, to my apartment. I knew I had, like, chore boy and pipes and shit there. So I actually called my father and asked him to go back with me to my apartment. And we walked into the apartment, and uh, I looked down into the hallway, and my toilet was in the hallway. And my dad's like, why is there a toilet in your hallway? And, like, I remembered, you know, I remembered being in the bathroom, locked in the bathroom, and looking up through the vents and stuff, and saw a police officer in the vent. Wow. Um, so, I, so, I, so I flushed my crack pipe down the toilet. And, you know, when I, five minutes later, I was like, what the fuck did I just do? Um, I ended up taking the toilet off and trying to find, because I, in my mind, you know, yeah. it was stuck in the pee trap because <laughs> yeah. I was a plumber. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, I was a plumber, you know, so like, I was like, oh, it's going to be in the pee trap. So I had undone my toilet to look for the crack pipe. Amazing. So, yeah, so anyway, this is just a piece of advice. If you ever flush your shit down the toilet, it's gone. Don't try to fucking disconnect your toilet and try to find your shit. It's gone. Right. Um, so, you know, that's a story that I'll never forget that, you know, I was so fucked up that I'm trying to find a crack pipe in a, in a, in a toilet that I, you know, disconnected from the entire wall. Well, that's the insanity, man. That's a great story. I appreciate it, Garen. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Have a good one. I really appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, you too, man. So that was cool. Garen James giving us a little dopey, telling us a little bit of his exploits and uh, his life running uh, an escort service. Did you ever want to run an escort service? Um, you know, that's, that's a field where there's always potential for, for money. So, you know, it's always somewhere in the back of my mind when I, when I, if I like really need money, I'm like, you know, maybe in that area of life, there's something I could figure out. There's no way you would ever figure that out though. Figure what out? As, running an escort service. <laughs> that seems very far out of your wheelhouse. Um, we didn't talk about the Knicks. Like, although I did want, wait, oh, sorry. Please. Wait. Although what? No, are we recording? Yeah. I, I did once have a, like, back when I was, like, this is a long, because I've been depressed. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't mean to, you know, uh, I hate fucking people. 
I didn't realize that, uh, like, you know, that guy who got just got fired from from Saturday Night Live. I don't know the story though. Well, I, like, I don't follow pop culture at all, but apparently, like, comedians, especially like white male comedians, there was like a trend of them talking about doing shtick about how depressed they they are or were. And I didn't know about that because I don't watch any comedians, even the famous ones, or except for, I mean, like from, from old school, from, like, yeah, yeah. like Martin Lawrence I love. But like um, apparently this is like a big trend. And the guy from Saturday Night Live got fired. Like I saw him making fun of them. And so I was like, wow, that... Sounds- he made fun of depression. Oh, no, of comedians who... Do shtick about depression and 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 is that know, why they fired him? No, 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 no. But <laughs> my point is, I just learned just now, just this past week, that like it was like some trend of like people to be like oversharing about their depression and like doing shtick about it and stuff like that. And I I don't want to be one of those people. So well, you didn't do any shtick about it. You were very real. No, but about like it. when I'm talking right now about you know about I was going to tell a story about I was going to tell a story about like a long time ago when I was uh, wait did did you did you did you cut the part where we were talking about uh about the uh, escorts s- uh, escorts stuff no. oh, okay yeah I was I was just going to say that it was that that like 8 years ago or something like that when I was also like you know dealing with with a lot of depression there was a guy who I uh who was you know sort of connected to, to the to the betting world you know and I was telling about my hopelessness and this and that and you know he was one of these he was like one of these guys who's like who had like a horrible upbringing I think he was maybe from Nicaragua originally or something I don't know but he was like really smart you know what I mean but like totally from the from you know the ghettos of somewhere uh, somehow got involved in like the betting world and and I wound up you know becoming friends with them somehow I was telling him how upset I was and depressed I was and he was like paraphrasing him he was like he was like all right well just don't kill yourself. Just give me one chance to start a, 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 an escort service importing women from Eastern Europe, and let's see if that one if that takes <laughs> off. And so I just remember that was like the one grain of hope that he gave me. He was like, "We can make real money doing this." And so uh, that's you know, so funny. Don't kill yourself un- un- until you uh, give me the chance to do this. You know, and obviously Maybe, it never happened. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I have no idea what this guy's doing today, but uh, you know, he's really nice. I, I love that guy. And now I'm going to change things up a little bit. Here is a dopey story from Evan. Hey, what's up, Dopey Nation? This is Evan in Atlanta. I wanted to tell you a story about something that happened to me in the early 2000s. Um, So I was in high school at the time and uh, went out to this raging house party. You know, everybody's real fucked up. And this dude shows up with a backpack full of these really strong... uh, pressed ecstasy pills everybody starts eating those you know getting real high feeling good and um i'm you know hanging out at the party for a little while and uh a group of some uh girlfriends of mine come over to me and they're like hey we're we're going over to uh to michelle's house you know the next town over do you want to come with us and these are like you know, it was like four of the, the hottest girls in my grade at the time. And I was like, hell yeah. Um, so hop in their car, uh, drive to the next town over, um, you know, planning on hanging out at this girl's house. Um, we get there and the lights are all on at the house. And uh, the girl whose house it is is like, hey, just wait in the car. I got to, you know, make sure everything's cool inside. You know, she goes inside comes back out and she's like hey my, my parents are awake you, you can't stay here tonight like you can't come over and I'm like what the fuck you know I'm fucked up as hell you know it's like kind of the middle of the night uh, this is before I had a cell phone and I was like well what am I supposed to do and she's like I don't know but but I gotta go so I'm like fuck you know they all leave you know thinking I'm gonna get some action uh nah so I'm like out by myself I start walking around the neighborhood and these pills uh, I guess it was MDA in them um I'm starting to get these like really crazy visuals I'm walking around this this suburban neighborhood and um all of a sudden I see a uh like a giant stop sign stop sign probably looks about like it's it's about like eight eight feet tall stop sign with a traffic light on top of it you know there's balloons tied to this traffic light and um it looked like the little uh the cop and the dog from the old cookie crisp cereal commercials are like standing in the middle of the street you know swinging a fire hose around there's fucking confetti exploding everywhere 
and um, it looks like there's these little Dalmatian dogs with fire hats crossing the road. And I'm like, holy shit, you know, my, my mind is just being blown by these visuals. And um, I like walk up closer to it and uh, realize it's like all a mirage created by a lawn sprinkler that's on in someone's front yard. So I'm like, whoa, what the fuck, you know, continue walking around the neighborhood just high as hell. Um, go across the street and there's like a like a wooded area that there's a uh, like a repelling a ropes course so there's a ladder going up into this tree i climb up into the tree i'm like laid out on this platform seeing all kinds of crazy visuals um you know just just fucking gone on another level um as the night progresses you know like i start to come down a little bit um i'm getting cold i think it was like in october or something and you know i've got you know nothing but a t-shirt on um so i'm like fuck like i need to i need to get some kind of shelter and i walk over um you know down the road a little ways there's a an elementary school and i end up seeing a uh one of those those big recycling bins and i'm like fuck that that seems like a a decent place to you know to to get out of the cold so i hop inside this this recycling bin and close the top and i pass out i end up waking up to this dude uh he's like hey man what, what are you doing in there i was like whoa what's going on and uh you know he was the uh the the waste management dude he was about to to dump the bin that i was like asleep inside of he was like i almost dumped you what you know why are you in there i was like oh this girl you know i was supposed to stay at this girl's house you know she kicked me out or whatever and he's like well just you know go ahead go on get out of there um so i get out of there i'm still like freezing um you know school still hasn't like started yet and um I see like a group of school buses. I go hop on one of the school buses and um, I'm chilling on there. I have like a bag of weed in my pocket, but I don't have a pipe or a lighter. And so I start rummaging through like the, the bus driver's stuff like up front and I'm able to find a cigarette lighter and like a pen that I make a makeshift pipe out of. So I'm sitting there you know, smoking herb at like, I don't know, five in the morning on this school bus. And, um, you know, I figure school's about to, about to start soon. So after like probably an hour of chilling out there, I end up like walking back to the neighborhood where my friend lives and just sitting at the front of the neighborhood waiting, you know, for them to eventually like wake up and leave. So I'm just sitting out on the curb for like a few hours and finally, um, yeah, may, maybe four hours later, you know, the car comes to the front of the neighborhood that's got, you know, my, my friends in it. And they're like, Evan, you know, how was your night? I was like, fucked up. How was your night? And they're like, it was actually kind of boring, you know, like we were just, we, we ended up just watching TV and, and, you know, passing out. Um, yeah, I guess my night was a little more interesting than that, but, um, that's pretty much the story. Y'all take care. Stay strong. Toodles. So there's uh, Evan's psychedelic story. I love that. You know what? I, it re- that guy was awesome. You know what it reminds me of? And what are you doing, dude? What's wrong with you? I, it just <laughs> makes me think. Do you remember we? Um, I think I might have brought it up on the last show. I know I brought it up with you at some point recently, where uh, when we were in college and uh, I was in the band that played rap music or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I never heard, so like never heard them. no 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 no. So we we came down to record, and me and Roland and Alan went down to Washington Square Park and we bought all these mushrooms. And then we went back to the studio and we all ate mushrooms. And you actually were on a bunch of the tracks playing piano and singing. And really? then we went up to Hunter. Serious? We went up to school, to our high school, and we and we played basketball tripping. <laughs> Did you remember that? No. I, I, I Did you eat d- mushrooms, you think? Definitely not, because uh I've I've actually I only ate mushrooms one time. It was in Costa Rica and I felt almost nothing, even though everyone else was but no, I I definitely I never did mushrooms. I 
definitely didn't. We were we were all we were all tripping out, right? And then we went over to Greg's apartment, and do you remember? And Jake, the bass player, came over. We're all tripping, and me and all those guys are basically like in Greg's sister's bed watching TV. And Jake walks in, and he's certain we're all just gay. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "I gotta get out of here." Um, but I, I'm, I'm surprised you weren't tripping that night. But no, it, I never did. The only time I ever, I, and it was only because a couple of friends of mine, we 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 went out to a cow pasture and picked them. And uh, it was it was a fun trip. Uh, I mean, <laughs> an actual trip, not the. But that was the only psychedelics you had ever done. Yeah, and I and I and I, I maybe they were like super weak or something because uh, I, I ate them and I didn't. I felt only very mild, like you know, less feelings. Than, yeah, right on. Less obvious than a cup of coffee. So one thing you might not know that's coming up in my life mm-hmm. is um, next week. Holy shit. Um, this episode is actually going to come out the day that I fly to Washington, D.C. with my buddy Ray. And me and Ray are going to drive from Washington, D.C. to Lewisburg, West Virginia for the Appalachian Healing Festival, of which I am emceeing the whole thing. <laughs> okay. 5,000 people. Wow. And I'm the MC. Maybe you could write some jokes for me. Sure, uh, of course I would. Maybe a, a, a healing festival. What is that like? It's about any, it's any like, and all kinds of healing. No, just like- opioid healing. No, I'm oh, sure okay. it's all kinds of healing. But it's because the opioid epidemic in West Virginia is so right. pronounced that they, you know, I think John Prine is one of the sponsors, and like this guy Tyler Childers, he's some big country guy. He's headlining the whole thing. So it's it's for people who are recovering opiate. No, it's for anybody in West Virginia who likes Americana music. Okay. But it's like the the cause is to support opioid addiction in West Virginia. Wow. Are you are you amazed? You mean to support people? Bot- Wait, I mean, I don't understand. It's a charity event to, to support an addiction in West Virginia. But I'm just saying, to buy, like, no, it's to buy West Virginian people dope to keep the, them to keep them high. No, it's like for programs and shit. Okay, okay, give me a break. All right. Okay, so it's healing from opiate addiction then. Yes. Are you excited? Yeah, it sounds great. Are you amazed? Can you yeah. imagine it? I mean, it's 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 they want me to play good so bad in front of 5,000 oh, people. That's awesome. I mean, that is a legitimately great song. When I hear about festivals like that though, I think I I think like, you know, in the 70s and 80s that would have been awesome. Now in 2019, I have no idea what those kinds of festivals are like. Is it the same thing as they were? I don't know what that I don't go anywhere. Yeah. I have no yeah, idea. I don't know either. Here, but in the spirit of this thing, here, read this email. Okay. Uh, what, is, what kind of email is this? I don't know. It's from this woman. Okay. You want me to read the whole thing? It's kind of long. Just read the thing. All right. I listen to your podcast all the time as I drive from rural community to rural community in southwest Virginia. I'm a psych professor at a university in south central Appalachia studying uh, really... It's actually to... pronounced Appalachia. Appalachia, right. Yes. Addiction. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of an organization that is trying to mobilize the church to be a support system to help people get sober and stay sober. I'm thinking of coming to the event on September 28th just to meet you, Dave. You should wow. come. She should come. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. Uh, it's about three and a half hours from where I live. Oh, don't drive three and a half hours to meet so me. So it's, it's quite gonna, manageable. It's going to be disappointing. Wow. Keep I, going. I, let, I just like to impress Peter with my yeah. bullshit level of fame. No, this is amazing. Keep going. Keep yeah. going. Yes. I know you may think it's strange for this middle-aged Christian church planting church planting, uh, unaddicted college professor to be listening to all of your drug stories, but my sister died of addiction in 1999, and I've been studying addiction and mentoring folks in the criminal justice system who are addicted for years. I've sat in court, driven door to door, trying to find someone who has relapsed and fallen off the grid, and sat in the ER with someone in withdrawal. Wow, this woman's like a Mother S- Teresa. Serious business. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'd like to give a shout out to you, Andrea Clements, for just being a good human, a great human being, you know? How do you, you don't know it's that. Awesome. It sounds like she's a good person. Though. Oh, continue. You mean maybe she's making this shit up. No, no, just Trying continue. To impress you? All right, okay. I like you giving her a shout out, though. Yeah. That's nice. I've had, oh, she cares about human suffering and tries to fix not the entire world, just do whatever she can. The only thing I know is she's a much better person than you. <laughs> <laughs> I've had those deep conversations with people about their own mortality. Uh, parentheses, if you don't stop, you will die, followed by the person saying, I'm okay with that and I'm going to keep using. Uh, end of 
parentheses. The discussions you have with people really help me learn what is going on inside someone's head while they are in active addiction. I currently have a federal grant to try to reduce addiction in rural Appalachia, so I feel like I should really be at this event. If I come, could I meet you and just say hi? I hate that it's too late to meet Chris or Todd. I hate that your dad isn't coming, but I'd love to touch base with you and maybe even plan a time to pick your brain a bit sometime. I don't think I wrote her back. Uh, I need to write her back. Yeah, sure. She sounds like uh, just just a, just, just a person who's like, all right, here I am in this. Can I curse in the show? You're right. Here I am in this fucking this fucked up world, and I'm just, I can't fix the world. I can't even make a small dent in like my community or whatever. But I'm just going to try with individual people in individual circumstances to help out however I can. Look at you. You're yeah. galvanized by her uh, her ah, spirit. I'm impressed by it. What's the end of it? That's it. My email is. Uh, should I read it? No, no, no. Yeah, no. that's it. That's it. It's all right. Fun. That's pretty inspiring, right? Yeah, it's great. So you know what else is inspiring to me? What's that? Artie Lang, as we've talked about, is out of is out of uh, rehab. He was in rehab for a long time. Yeah, good for him. I mean, if Artie, if you're listening, and I know you're not, but I mean, it's great. Anyone, just having seen what happened to you, I now anyone who beats addiction, I get a, a, a warmth inside myself because but, I know how horrible it is. But the most amazing thing is that anybody can, and people like to say Artie can't do it, but he can. And um, when Artie was on the show last, he was high as shit. Yeah. And Chris was also high as shit. So I think Artie should come back on the show sober, you know? And, like, people are like, leave him alone, blah, blah, blah. But he's, like, touring now. He's, like, doing a million gigs. And if I don't strike the, the, the iron while the... What is the expression? Strike the hammer okay, while yeah. the iron is hot. Why are you obsessed with Artie, though? I love Artie. Um, I spent so many years listening to him when I was getting high. He's funny. Mm-hmm. He's a, a heroin addict. He's come back from the brink. He's the real thing. Uh, and I love him, you know. I could probably get I could probably reach out and get Artie on the show. How? What can you do? <laughs> one of his uh one of his compatriots in comedy who is a uh, a, a guy who uh is also uh a sports betting guy and used to uh, I, I did videos with him years ago I can't remember his fucking name but uh, he, who, uh, Nick the bag no 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 his name coach oh, Mike no 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 the his, mustache I can't remember um, my mind it's, it's slipping his name is slipping my uh, my mind now Jerry the scumbag no it's 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 a guy that already did uh, shows with and made fun of he used to always say uh, uh, Jim Florentine no 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 he's not that famous he, he used to always say like daddy like that was his big joke and already <laughs> used to make fun of him for. but I used to do videos with him all the time because he was also a, uh, a sports betting guy no, I'm kidding. I can get Artie back. But I did actually... Uh, so you can't do anything? No. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, I think... What's this guy's name? Tomorrow, I'm going to go catch the ferry. And you can come with me if you want. Sure. You and me, we're going to catch the ferry. We're going to go to Hoboken around 11. We're going to sit in front... Because I've been to his house. I know where he lives. We're going to sit in front of his building and wait for him. And then we'll have lunch... And then I'll write a letter to him and I'll leave it with the doorman and we'll leave. So we can like we can stalk in a good cop, bad cop kind of way. Like you can stalk him and then I can be right behind right beside you apologizing to yeah, him. Already, I can't him. believe he's so yeah. fucking stupid. I'm, I want to apologize for my friend. No, um God, I can't remember. I, I want to I don't care his name. Let it go. This is why you're so depressed. You <laughs> hold on to these stupid <laughs> fucking things. Uh yeah, I get why don't you get like CC DeVille from Poison on? That would be a good guess. I don't think his name is is it DeVille? <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's his name. No. No, I mean Artie is uh is he the most prominent former drug addict? I don't it, I love Artie. What do you mean? I I have a thing for Artie. Yeah. Well, who do you want how, to see on the he, show? How does he feel about you? Is he like... He doesn't know who I am. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't remember. No? You know, one time, I, you know, I stalked him while he was on the Anthony, Anthony Cumia show. I would yeah. go see him there all the time. And he was in bad shape. Yeah. And one time, he like... It was winter and it was raining and he didn't even have a jacket. So I walked him to the thing to the to get him back to, to Jersey and he didn't have his car. So I'm walking behind him holding an umbrella over his head and he's like, I, I don't even know where the path train is. <laughs> and I was like, uh, he was like, just walk me to 34th street. And I was like, okay. And I'm walking him to 34th street and uh, we're at Penn station. He goes, there's no path train here. I'm going to get a taxi. And he's like, he's in bad shape. And I got him a taxi and I put him in the cab. And Are you t- serious? He- see, this is exactly, see now I'm, I'm, Kick back to when we were 16 It's exactly like when we were in high school 
accept you replace celebrities with girls. And we had the exact same, like my attitude with girls was always like, you know, I don't want to bother them. I'm sure they, you know, maybe they'd like to talk to me, but on the, you know, whatever the chances are that they want to be bothered, I don't want to bother them. So I'm going to stay off. And you were just like going for it. And it's the same, I feel like this, it's the same way with celebrities. Well, I'm like, in a monogamous relationship, no, so I no, can't no, pursue no, girls. Make, so I pursue no, I'm, yeah, I'm making an analogy here. No. Like, don't you, like my, my, I would always be like if there was some celebrity that that that, that I that I loved or respected or whatever. Uh, this is an underhanded wanna, way that you're putting me down. I'm just by I'm the just, way, I'm just amazed that you um, like chutzpah balls. Yeah, what do you like, want to call like, it? You don't have the thought in your head like maybe I'm bothering or annoying the hell out of this person. No, I'm I'm being self serving. You know <laughs> right, what I mean? Right, right. Like I I want to make the show better. Right. I, I think it'll make the show better. I think it's funny. Like, I think this kind of a pursuit is a funny pursuit. It is, yes. And I think it makes the show better. And I think maybe it could help Artie, too. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you could. You don't think so? No, maybe it could. Sure, definitely. Actually, yes, I do. Except that, like, he, he's like, like how, how, it's hard to convert a person that you're stalking into uh, being someone who, uh, well, maybe it's not. It's, it's just like a woman. Yeah. It's just like a girl. Yeah. They, maybe they don't want you to right. stalk them until they, they, it turns exactly. out they like you. Yeah. No, look, yes. You with me? I'm convinced, yeah. Thank you. Wow. Peter, as always, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Is there yeah. anything else you'd like to add? Uh, not really. Do you, have, do you have any impressions you might want to do? Maybe a little Israeli, a little Jamaican? What do you got? No, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm tired right now. I'm trying to think. What impressions would you like me to do? I would like you to do, you know, I opened this show, this episode, mm-hmm. with uh, the classic rocker T-track, Dopey oh, yeah, podcast. Yeah. So I would love it if you if you finish the show with a little rocker tea. If you guys don't know, Rocker T was this uh, reggae singer that Peter and I loved when we were growing up. And Rocker T, you know, now he teaches sailing school in uh, in Oakland. Do you know that? Are you serious? I am. Um, and I love Rocker T. And he did a song for the Dopey podcast. And Peter. Uh, why don't no, I, you? I, don't, I can't do a rock. Do a little rock or tea. No, I, I'm not that fully recovered from from uh, from my firing to uh, to be able to do impressions yet. To be able to do impressions on you know on command on command. Request. You can't do anybody's impression. How about the Israeli guy? The thing is, the thing I feel bad about though is that uh, I don't know if you remember this, but when we were all like hanging out, I actually did used to do a Todd impression, which you used to enjoy. Do you remember that? Like my impression of Please. Todd asking. No, I can't do it anymore. Let me hear. Like, come on, you can't tease me with it. Let me hear a little Todd. Like he'd be like, uh, he'd be like, uh, like, <laughs> like, like uh, uh, give me some, some fucking uh, fish food or a sandwich or uh, you don't remember that? Like when th- when I would go out and he'd be like, uh, hey, P- P- Peter, maybe you go get me something. <laughs> and then and then he'd be like, uh, and then I do my impression and like you know everyone who you do impressions of, if you do it to their face, they think it doesn't sound like them, including junkies. So Todd'd be like, that doesn't sound like me at all. And he'd see you laughing and then he'd be like, oh, okay. Okay, he would go, okay, he would go, okay. I remember he would go, oh, yeah, maybe it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He would say he'd that. Go, oh, oh, okay, okay. And he'd like stick his hand out and be like, uh, uh, all right, if, if Dave's laughing. All this while he's on the nod, right? And all this while he's like, you know. He would get so high, high, right? Yeah. And he'd be like, eh, that doesn't sound like me at all. And then you'd be laughing. <laughs> and then he'd be like, oh, oh, okay, all right, all right, I admit it. I don't know if you were there, but. Around that period, uh, I, 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 it was like when I was sort of pursuing being a songwriting singer type guy, and I met this weird guy who was a singer songwriter, and I had him come back to the apartment. And then um, me and Jeremy wanted to make a movie about it. And the guy called himself Kingfish, okay? So me and Jeremy made this movie about the time, because Kingfish had a friend who was this woman who he said was Renee Russo. And he said, is it okay if Renee Russo stays at your place for a few days because she got kicked out of her house in the Hamptons? Yeah, I do vaguely remember. And I was like, I was like, okay. (laughs) He sends this woman over to my apartment who he tells me is Renee Russo, but it was not (laughs) Renee Russo. (laughs) And it was very weird. And she stayed there for a few days and then she left. And then me and Jeremy wanted to make a a short film (laughs) called The Renee Russo Story. And, uh, And in one of the scenes I had, I think Todd was playing himself Jeremy was playing Kingfish and I was playing myself and Todd was supposed to come out of the elevator 
come to the apartment and take a bong hit. And and he couldn't do it right. And he took like 50 bong hits <laughs> until he was too high to like even get out of the elevator or whatever. Do you know remember? It was very... No, funny. I do. I mean, like the, the feeling of this story, it's it's making me a little bit sick because like I, I, of course I remember it. Stuff like that happened every day and every week. And I guess in retrospect, it's like kind of funny. But like when I think back on those stories, I just, I just, I get this deep, sick feeling of like wasted potential, you know, for, for me and you and other people, you know, and it just like, that's what it reminds me of. I know it's a funny story. Way to ruin the show, Pete. <laughs> that's fucking great. No, I'm just Thanks saying, for like, ruining the show. Tell me that story. It's like, yeah, I, I, I vaguely remember the Rene Russo story that, yes, I do sort of remember that. And I vaguely remember Kingfish. But what I mostly remember is just like the, the like stuff like that would happen all the time. And yeah, it's funny in retrospect a little bit. But I understand. Most, mostly, I just feel sick about like it. Mostly reminds me of of wasted wasted uh, opportunities and wasted potential. And this is why you're mired in your no, depression because <laughs> you have no fucking joy from a fucking <laughs> pathetic story like that. No, it's just I'm just telling you what it reminds me of, how it makes me feel. Like, all right, it, it hits me like when you're telling that story, it all comes flooding back to me, and it's like I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I take I relish the misery. The personally. one thing I'll tell you the one thing about this show that I hope it doesn't do, which I, I don't think it does, but um, I hope that this show doesn't in some way, in any way, like like glorify addiction or or like no the point is what you said before you couldn't believe how on the brink of of death and misery i was and how much better i am now the point of the show is you can come out of it and live a productive life and be connected to your friends and your family and be responsible and reflect back on the idiotic shit and laugh because you're not doing it anymore right that's the idea but i just hope that this that this show in in some way doesn't like you know like you're telling all these like you know, funny, fucked up stories. They are like in retrospect, they're funny and fucked up. But I hope it doesn't make anyone like you know hear 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 the show and then be like, yeah, I want to have those experiences too because they're so funny and fucked up. You know, no, it's more like uh, how stupid was your life when you weren't living it properly? Yeah, you know, that's really the story. I'm gonna go stalk Artie Lang in full sobriety tomorrow. <laughs> yes, yes, how stupid can your life right. be and in if, sobriety? Right. And if you're <laughs> yes, that's true. You know. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you for, for bringing your dark cloud Anytime. to another episode of Dopey. Anytime. Stay strong, Dopey Nation, and fucking toodles for Chris and, uh, and for Todd, because this was a lot of Todd stuff. Thank you, Peter. I want to take a walk around the world. I wonder would it do me any good. Until I get some money in my pocket, then I guess I'll just have to walk around my neighborhood. But I want to be good so bad want to be so good, so bad, so bad I want to be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had And I want to take a ride up in the sky Watch this airplane just pass me by And I want to see a Lear jetliner take a dive Show all of these people what it means to be alive But I want to be good so bad Want to be so good, so bad, so bad I want to be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had And my shadow's getting smaller and smaller smaller and smaller and it's high noon where I stand and I wonder would they pay it any mind when I leave this busted city far behind I'll take the high road however far it winds because peace and love are very 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 hard to find and I want to be good so bad So bad, so bad I wanna be good So bad Bad desire's all I ever had Damn it, all these suckers Make me mad And it's all I ever had And it's all I ever had And these suckers make me mad And I wanna call my dad And it's all I ever had 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 And these suckers make me mad And it's all I ever had